I'd like to read the text for you today, if you have the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's good to use your eyes on the screen and the Word. And I, I want to give you an advanced organizer. He knows my name. He's called me by my name. I tell you, that was one of my favorite songs. And after 12 years at Amherst, at our closing service, I picked that song as one of the songs I wanted song, sung. My son, Matt, informed me of it years ago. And, and our worship leader, uh, Jay, followed my lead on, on those songs that I wanted. And uh, his wife was quite a pianist. She played for the Thomas Rhodes Baptist Church. <laughs> so when she played that and we sang that, uh, it was very moving, very moving. He knows my name. But the call, five times in these nine verses, if you have the New International Version, Paul will talk about call. And I'll tell you in just a moment what I told the elders when we are seeking a senior pastor about the call. Here it is. You'll hear the word four times, and then I'll explain the fifth time. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and what? Called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, Paul says. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Now remember, this was his most dysfunctional church. This was the church that gave him more challenges, more problems, more difficulties than any other we know of. And he's thanking God because of them. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, what you talk about, and in all your knowledge, what you're studying and learning and receiving. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Even then, they were looking for the second coming. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is what? Is Faithful. Can you say the word faithful? God is faithful. Now, if you were following along in, in the NIV or perhaps in your Bible, you're saying, well, Pastor Flegel, you can't count. Yes, I can. There are only four calls. Now, there were five. I'm going to show you the one that's hidden. When he talks about the church, the word for church is ek. Exit signs, that's where it comes from, the Greek. One out of every eight English words comes from the Greek language. Alexander the Great spread Greek over the known world, and one out of eight words that you and I speak come from the Greek. So there is the ek. Ek means out, doesn't it? And then klesia. means called. You, as a believer, are the called out ones. You have been called out from what? From the world, from the cosmos, from the sinful entity. And you form a new body, the body of Christ. So this is the fifth call. Now, I promised you I'd share some backroom secrets. When I met with the elders, I said... We are not hiring a pastor. We are calling a pastor. This is a spiritual transaction to a very spiritual position. Now, you could say all of us are called to do what we do, but the Bible makes special designation of shepherds, okay? 
And so I said to the elders, when we talk about this, we want to talk about being called, not hired, called. Jesus spoke about the hireling in John chapter 10 and said, when the wolf comes, the hireling, the guy you paid money to stay, he runs. We're talking here about calling. And Paul said, I am called. Kaleo is the verb. Klesia is part of the church. Same root. God has done something to bring us out for a ministry, for a purpose, for a function. And the same for the church here at Cross Point. He has called us out from the world to be a light to the world. So Paul makes this point very clear as he writes to the Corinthians. Now, in all but four of his 12 letters that we have, he identifies himself by name and his role as an apostle. Now, this is interesting for the Christian Missionary Alliance. When I was, I was writing my one book, Jaywalking, Jesus Walking, uh, and I was studying about mission, Dennis. No, I was studying about mission, and I studied the word apostolos. And in the first four centuries after Christ, apostle meant, now listen, this is important for all of you, because sometimes we think missionary is the guy or girl who goes and takes the gospel. The meaning of that word, apostolos, is not only the one sent, but the one sending. That's us. We are part of the apostleship. Do you, do you catch it? Now, after the fourth century, then it kind of watered down, got diluted, and now we think, well, the missionaries are the ones who are sent. But that word meant also the ones who enabled the missionary to be sent. Isn't that a powerful concept? For the Christian Missionary Alliance. It's not only those who are on the field, it's us back here who are praying, who are giving, who support, and who help send. It's an exciting concept. So as you do that here at Crosspoint, you are fulfilling an apostolic ministry. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. All right. So he's telling them he is called, and he's telling them He's an apostle, one who is sent. And then, of course, I, I just explained, not only the one who is sent, but the one who is sending. Then he says, the church is made up of those who are sanctified and called by the Lord to enter it. You were issued a call from the Lord to come out of your sin to be redeemed, to be bought back by the blood of Christ. And that's exciting. John Wesley talked about provenient grace, pre-before-venient venue, before the moment. In other words, you didn't initiate your salvation, none of you. As nice as Leah, you are, God first called you before you called out to him. That's just provenient grace. That's grace. Not what you did or what I did. On April 1st, 1962, April Fool's Day, I became a fool for Christ's sake. As a 12-year-old boy, I went to the altar because I was called of God to confess my sin and to lean on his righteousness and to receive forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross. Exciting. Exciting. So, this whole idea of calling is important. We are in the midst of calling someone. Paul said he was called. Those who are saved are called. The church means the called out ones. Now, that means we have to live differently. There has to be a contrast between church people and worldly people. And that is getting muddied now. It's getting muddied. We have to be careful. Now, I'll get to the personal responsibility, but I, I just want to lay out this foundation of calling. And so, whenever we accept Jesus, Paul said, he is Savior and Lord. And you can't say, well, I'm saved, but he's not Lord. The Scriptures don't give you that option. 
In the great Pentecostal sermon that Peter preached, he said, he is Savior and Lord. The Acts refer to his Lordship. When you get saved, he's Lord. He's Lord. You may have to grow into submitting to his Lordship, but tell me this. When you got saved, did he become your Lord? Amen. He calls the shots. He's the candidate. We buy into his platform. We live by the way he lived. We do as he does and did. And so this whole greeting is about calling. God calls Paul to be an apostle. God calls us to enter into his kingdom. God calls people to come out from among them, separate yourselves from the world, be different, be a counterculture, calling. Now, he will go on, and I called this strength and honor. And um, I was watching the movie Ben-Hur last night. Did anybody else see it? Thank you, brother. When the emperor says, what is your name? It was interesting. Judah, Ben, Her. Okay? Judah means what? Praise. The Jews, the word and name Jews means praise. Isn't that exciting? People would praise. Okay? Ben, whenever you see Ben, it means son of. Son of. Ur is the family name. So his name was Judah, the son of Ur. But there is a point, and that's a great movie to watch. Did you know that a couple people died in the actual chariot race? They didn't make it. But they go, the emperor, not the emperor, the commander goes, honor, and the, you tapped your chest. In the movie Gladiator, which Faye does not like, I just want to get that out there, but it won seven Academy Awards, and it has some biblical truth woven into it. I'm not saying it's a Christian movie, but I'm saying it's a movie that does not ignore faith. But before they go into battle against my people, the Germanic people, the Flegels, Flugel, German for wing, they go, strength and honor, strength and honor. Strength and honor. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about a people who have been called out from the world who are going to be strong. And he will say that. You're going to be strong. And you're to honor God. Maybe a good symbol for us. Now, I'm, I'm not going to start that, but strength and honor. Maybe to the grandchildren before they play sports. Strength and honor. I like that. He's calling them to something. And he's thankful for them, even though they have many flaws. And you're going to see it through this sermon. I mean, people are getting intoxicated at communion. <laughs> They're getting drunk at communion. People are having relationships interfamily with parents and children. I mean... The issues he addresses here in this book of 1 Corinthians are serious, but he still thanks God for them even despite their flaws. And I need that and you need that because none of us is perfect. All of us make mistakes. When you got saved, that didn't mean you never sinned. Even when you got sanctified, it didn't mean you never sinned. And so he's thankful to God for even those who are in Corinth in the church. Now, the word for thankful is Eucharistio. What do the Catholics call what we name as the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion? What do Catholics call it? The Eucharist, right. Comes from the Bible. Comes right from the original text. Now, 
Now as they were eating, Jesus gave bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. And he took a cup and when, here it comes, and when he had given what? Thanks. He gave it to them saying, that's the word Eucharistio, the Eucharist. He's giving thanks for these people and their many flaws. He's looking for something redemptive in them. Now, later on, will he discipline them? You know, I I remember my mother. uh, I was the oldest son. The oldest child, I think, gets more beatings than any other. Thank you. I think think that's true. You know, I had to work for a car. Then he had to work for a car. My youngest brother, Rick, was driving one of those new Coca-Cola cars. How in the world did he get that? He was, he was paying on it some, but last child, right? Okay? And my mother, when I did something wrong, and um, I did a few things wrong, especially before I was saved. And uh, she would say to me, she'd take me in, and those toys, you know, the paddle with the elastic rubber and the little ball, and it's a toy, and after the band breaks, it's a weapon. You know what I mean? And mother would say to me, Arnie, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And my thought was, then mother, spank yourself. So, he's going to compliment them. He's going to tell them how thankful he is to God for them. And he's going to say, you're enriched in two different ways. In two different ways you're enriched. One in your speech, logos, the word, and the other in knowledge, gnosis, all right? So in what you're speaking and in what you're learning, you're, you're growing. You're growing up. However, you have to put into action what you're speaking and what you're knowing. My dad said to me, Arnie, don't do as I do, do as I say. I, that's a, it's not the best fatherly advice. But in my dad's case, it was good advice. <laughs> yes. So, speech and knowledge, right? And he says, and as you live out your faith, as you and I live out our faith, we confirm the validity of ministry. Paul says, as you do these things which are righteous, which are true, which are noble, which are good, all those things he talked about in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, uh, it, it validates the preaching of God's word. When the word is preached today, if some of you, hopefully many of you and I, take the word and live it out in our lives, it confirms the validity of the message and its power. And so the Corinthians, he said, have all these gifts. Now, they struggled with the gifts. And, and you know this, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, many of the gifts are listed. Not all 27, depending on if there's 24, 25, 26, 27. Um, but they struggled in the gifts. And he said, well, pursue the higher gifts. Uh, because they stumbled over tongues. We know that. And he's trying to explain glossolalia. And we won't get into that this morning. All right? But the gifts were given by God to the church for the building up of the body of Christ. And so it's important that we understand why gifts are given. And he said, you've got them. I was listening to the uh, prospective candidate's message uh, that you had recommended November 19th, and I, I'm, I'm going to send you that. I have a note to send you his, there's, there's like 12 messages there, and it was called The Stewardship of New Wine. That guy can preach. And his point was, from the story of David when his 
army was in need of food and they were running out of supplements and all of a sudden there come the donkeys there come the foodstuffs there come the wine and he said god has provided and will provide for you what are you doing with the provisions he's given you that was the point of the message lonnie in other words yes he's given but what are you going to do with them are you going to use these resources now the jew had three ways of evaluating stewardship one giving to god two taking care of your family and he brought that out tom by the way in that sermon and then number three was benevolence meeting needs in other words with what god gives Faye and i if we are evaluating ourselves through the judeo-christian ethic it is like this one are we giving him the first fruits of all our increase two are we taking care of our families and three are we giving to people in need if you're doing that then you crossed off all the boxes for the jew and he said you 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 have all these gifts and of course he expected dividends from those gifts just like we do in a local church god gives people gifts they don't want to bury them because there's judgment for burying gifts parable of the talents five made five two made two the one buried it and the judge said um the entrepreneur said why didn't you put it in the bank and at least get interest you didn't do anything with it so the brother we're interviewing tomorrow night he challenged them what are you doing with the gifts and paul said you have all the gifts you need and who by the way gives the gifts who gives us our spiritual gifts the holy spirit thank you not just dennis that's all i answer who gives us the spiritual gifts the holy spirit so we shouldn't brag about them because it's god who's decided what you got and what you don't have i always wanted to be an artist i really did i wanted to draw and when i drew a fish for faith sunday school class and they didn't recognize it i knew i didn't have that gift I, i'm just being honest here bart i i just i'm not an artist so i you know how i paint with words i write that that rick that's the way i've interpreted that because what i've drawn people look at it and they go and even when children can't recognize a fish come on but the gifts are given for the body of christ to build them up and he said you have the gifts and we know that from later chapters and hopefully you'll have a pastor by then so i won't be preaching from first corinthians 12 and 14 but he said two outcomes of god's faithfulness and provision what god is doing now what god is doing you have gifts you should be doing you've been called out of the world ecclesia you should be separate you should be a counterculture you should be lights in a dark world shining as stars in a dark universe philippians chapter 2 verse 14 now what about his faithfulness what is it going to produce his provision what is it going to produce two things that you're strong to the end you can start the game fast and finish it slow and lose and lose i was i was watching um the national television well it was the big 10 network of penn state uh the big 10 wrestling tournament yesterday and do you know at the first weight 125 the number one seed lost the number two seed lost and the number three seed got beat by the penn state freshman i mean i was enjoying it i was enjoying it and by the way they set a record never have seven out of ten championship finals in the big ten been represented by one team penn state okay i just thought i'd throw that in there i was rooting for some ohio state you're 180 pounder he's a freshman he's a beast but you can be ahead in the beginning of the match and not finish well are you, are you with me 
And he says, what God has done allows you, there are no excuses, you can finish well. You know, the pregnancy. You can finish well. This dear lady is due in May. May 16th. So we'll get ready to give you gifts, money, cards, etc. Finish strong. Strength and honor. I'm almost done. Then he says, the one who calls you, there it is again, kaleo, is faithful. All right. Now, what does this mean, Pastor Arnie? It means, like for the Corinthians, we can survive Babylon. We can win in a losing culture. Amen? We don't have to get taken over. We don't have to get metamorphosed. We don't have to be transformed by an evil environment, by an evil culture, and become part of their woodwork. We are the change agents who can survive. But I want to tell you something. On this day, March 10th, 2024, Christians are under attack. All right? A Fox News guy, Todd Stearns, wrote a book Godless America. Now, I'm leading to something here. I've got to be strong. You've got to be strong. We've got to make a statement in this world. We've got to rise up as the church of Jesus Christ. Godless America, and he wrote about the attack on Christians and religious people, but primarily Christians. All right, here are some of the examples he gave. I don't think you'll know all of these. A group of children went into a VA hospital to sing Christmas carols, and a government agent came up and took the carols away and gave them a sheet of approved Christmas carols. Can you imagine that? You can't sing Christmas carols? Well, they don't want you to say Christmas anymore. Right? Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. What they don't know is the word holiday comes from two words, holy day. (laughs) So if you want to say it, you can say it. But I would recommend Merry Christmas. Get Christ lifted up. Take away what little children, what are we teaching them? Okay? Praying in public now is often forbidden. What's happened to the Ten Commandments? It's been taken out of public buildings. Is that true? You've heard it. You've read about it. Yes. If you you look around and listen, you have this de-Christianizing of America. This taking God out. I'm just not talking about prayer in schools. We took that out. We used to read the Bible. Maybe it was boring. Maybe it was art for art's sake. But at least they knew what was in portions of the Bible and you started the day with the Bible. And what is happening in the public schools today is why CBCA has too many students to admit this year. They have gone from 850 to 1,200 in like three years. That's amazing. And you know why? Because of the erratic heresies the attacks against Christianity in the public schools. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be a public school teacher. We need godly public school teachers who will be light in the darkness. And one candle can chase away the darkness. But I'm telling you, we are under attack. We are under attack. Stearns, he gives a few more examples that that I, I just want to share with you. Nativity scenes. How many local communities have taken nativity scenes out of their public displays? Including some, I believe, in our area. No, you you can't have that, right? 
He found out, and he put it in the book, that at one of these DEI, these diversity trainings the military did, they labeled Catholics and evangelical Christians as terrorists. I mean, he, he has it footnoted. He has it substantiated. What is happening to our culture, brothers and sisters? Not only the Corinthians dealt with it, and some of them were being changed by it, but the church in our day and believers in our day are kind of surrendering their God-given principles and rights. I was, and I don't agree with everything John MacArthur has written, but he's done a lot of excellent writing and commentaries And I admire him for standing up to the state of California who said that he couldn't have church. He had church. And guess who won the lawsuit? John MacArthur and his church. Isn't that interesting? If we would just stand up once in a while. And even if we don't win, we witness. Even if we don't win, we witness. Are you with me, church? So as we start this series and I'm looking forward to preaching. And, and Mallory, you have next week's outline, okay? You're going to see a church that has some positives, some wonderful traits. He's thanking God for them. But you're going to see a church wrestling with carnality. And some of our churches and some of God's people have unfortunately, have unfortunately bought in. But we don't have to. And instead of depending on men and what they say, let's depend on the one who created men. <laughs> let's depend on the Lord. They tell us we can't do it. Now, we should pray for those in authority, right? Right? In Paul's letter to Timothy, he said, pray for those in authority. He said, you pray for the president. I do. You pray for the vice president. I do. You pray for their election. I'll take the Fifth Amendment. But we should be praying for them. We should be praying for the Supreme Court. They have decisions which will affect the church of Jesus Christ. There are nine people there. And God could change the heart and mind of Pharaoh. He could change the heart and mind of Darius the Persian in Daniel's day. So God can change people. And for the 535 members of the House of Representatives in the Senate, let's pray that the Holy Spirit will get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. Amen. We can do that. We can do that. Now, I just don't want to be hammering at carnality. I want myself and you to understand that God has called you and I for a purpose. It is a high and holy purpose, Rick. And it is to be light and salt and sweet perfume. When I was dating Faye, there was a perfume called Ambush. I don't know if they still sell it, Lori. But I'll tell you this, it was a second-story apartment where she lived, and when I opened the first-story door, I was done, man, ambush. That was it. It was that powerful, that stuff. That's the way he talks about us. Sweet fragrance. He does. He uses that. He uses that metaphor. He said, we are living stones, Tom. Others can stand on our testimony and see God and reach Jesus. Next, he said, you are letters read of all men. People are watching. People are watching. And I did tell my boys, I don't know if I've shared this with you, but I took Matt and Mark aside, and I said, if you boys do anything that is really offensive and brings reproach to our family, And our church, I am resigning as a senior pastor. I wanted them to know that. Because a man that can't manage his own household cannot manage the church of God. They knew it. 
Now, were they perfect? No, they, they hung around with the elders' kids. But um, Paul said, bad company spoils good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that's the Bible. But it's, it's important that we stand. So in my neighborhood, in your neighborhood, in the grocery store, some people show carnality in the grocery store. That is a race of past older people, you know. Oh, there's a, why not? By the way, I just remembered, thank you, Lord. I led a guy up in line at the gas station about two weeks ago, and I went to pay. He had paid for my gas. Lonnie, mark this down. Because I'd done, what? I'd left him one place in line. No, you, you go ahead. Now I'm inviting everybody to go one place in line. Just kidding. But people are watching. They're listening. Rise up, O oh men of God. Rise up, O oh women of God. Let's stand in the gap. Let's be God's called out ones, you know. When you have a child, you dedicate that child to God. That's what Hannah did. That's what Joseph and Mary did for Jesus. You say, this is the Lord's child, and I want the church and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to be living in my child. And I think you'll do that. And that's what your boy did, Ryan and Sarah. That's a statement. It's a statement. Yes, he's not ours. He's the Lord's. Let's pray. Dennis, you and Lori can come. But let's first of all ask the Lord to apply this to our hearts and minds, to our steps and speeches, to our spending and our receiving and giving of resources. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your word is exciting and it is instructive, and it is relevant. And I just pray today that we'd realize the battle we're in. We can't bury our heads in the sand. We can't be an ostrich. We've got to rise up. We've got to stand up. We've got to speak up. We've got to count for your glory. And I thank you for everyone in this very room who is doing that. Help me to do it more. Help me to not be intimidated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And help our people here not to be intimidated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. You are faithful, and you provide, and so we can be strong to the end. We can finish the game. As Paul said, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. May that be said of each of us in this very room, and may we rise up. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we expect. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory.